everybody on this call, believe it or not, have been a disinflationary force. We are now enabled to do things that we were not able to do before, which takes away pricing power. I call it very simply the Amazon, Google, and Uber effects. Uh, Mohammed, just to pick up on that theme on uh, central bank easing, of course, it's been a very, very major uh, talking point uh, throughout 2020, and in fact, in the lead up to uh, 2020. Um, and I guess the timing is quite interesting because, of course, we have the Federal Reserve convening this week for their last policy meeting of 2020. Um, of course, amid surging coronavirus cases stateside and unbalanced U.S. economy, which you related to, and unfortunately, no congressional fiscal package to speak of yet at the time of this recording. Many economists see this as an opportunity for perhaps a dovish Fed to expand on that 120 billion monthly bond purchases, or they may even look at adjusting the maturity of these pur uh, purchases. On the other hand, there's also a school of thought that suggests the Fed may sit on their hands with the hope of putting pressure back on the federal government and calling for more action from the fiscal side um, and perhaps waiting until, ja until January to decide on, um, on additional measures. With so much uncertainty, Mohammed, leading up to this meeting, what are you expecting uh, to come out of this? So let me, let me divide it between what the Fed should do, go off, and what the Fed will do. The Fed should sit on its hands. The Fed should not be dragged back in because I think there is a lot of evidence right now that when you look at the key phrase that Ben Bernanke put out there in 2010, when the Fed went unconventional, not to normalize markets, but to pursue macroeconomic objectives, he said, quote, it's about benefits, costs, and risks. And I think most people agree now that the economic benefits of more QE are de minimis, but importantly, the costs and risks are going up. So what the Fed should do is sit on its hands, to quote you. But what the Fed will do is be even more dovish. And to understand that, you've got to understand the mentality of a central bank. Um, the central bank is like, a, is like a doctor. The doctor never walks away from their patient, never. Even if the doctor doesn't have the right medicine, the doctor will continue to try and treat the patient. And what the Fed is looking at right now is the worst of all worlds. It's this risk in the US, its main focus of a vicious cycle. Public health is getting worse. COVID is basically out of control right now in terms of hospitalization, in terms of death, in terms of cases, over 200,000 cases in the US, over 30,000 in California alone. Public, so there's a public health issue the economy, as I mentioned, is already contracting. As you pointed out, fiscal policy is not getting anywhere. And what will materialize, and I suspect something will materialize, will be very small. And individual behaviors, people are losing trust in the process. So what you get is risk aversion building up, economic risk aversion building up on the economic pressure. So in a, in a situation like that, the Fed will feel that it has no choice but to do more. So expect the Fed to at least, at least give us very reassuring guidance on QE, basically telling us it's not just low for long on rates, it's long for long on, on, on QE. And that will continue this process of providing markets enough reassurance of liquidity to set aside all the other things that are less convenient. So it certainly is a growing risk and it's a growing risk um, for two reasons. One, and there's a lot of uncertainty here. So, so, so let, me, let me explain what the uncertainty is. First, we have gone through a massive period of disinflation, of downward pressure on prices. And it has to do with our behavior. Everybody on this call, believe it or not, have been a disinflationary force. We are now enabled to do things that we were not able to do before, which takes away pricing power. I call it very simply the Amazon, Google, and Uber effects. Amazon, what do we do in Amazon 
we basically disintermediate suppliers. That's what we do. When you order on Amazon, you're taking out someone in the supply chain and that lowers pricing power. When you Google, you search, you become a much more informed consumer. You become much more price sensitive. You gain, okay, pricing information, which means that you, you again, limit how much you can be charged on price wise. That's disinflationary. And Uber, which, which is spreading, which is the notion that you bring existing assets. Cars in Uber exist, but they're not being used efficiently. When you bring existing cars into the marketplace, what you do is you increase supply in a way that limits the price rise. So we have gone through this multi-year effects. I, I don't know whether these are repeated every year or not. My own gut feeling is there's a limit to that disinflationary effect. So on the supply side, what have been very strong disinflationary winds are gonna to start to die down. On the demand side, you're having a reaction to increase concentration. We're coming out of this COVID with much more concentrated firms than before. Plus, you have all this massive liquidity. So my own view is there's a really high risk that the markets, even with the adjustments you've noted, are underestimating the longer term, longer term, not, th not this year, not next year, but the longer term from 2022 onwards, the longer term inflationary trends. They really are underestimating the longer term inflationary trends and that we will see a significant steepening of yield curves as people realize that they no longer have the supply disinflationary. Whether it's stag, so, so that's the inflation part. Yes, I do worry about the inflation part. Whether it's the stag part is gonna depend on what comes after the vaccine. It's the scarring element. Scarring is this very simple economic notion that you turn short-term problems into long-term structural issues. Let me give you two examples. Suppose today you are a restaurant or suppose today you are a small shop that has to shut down because of restrictions. If you go bankrupt, recreating that shop is much, much harder than if you just simply open it up again um, before that. If you are someone who just graduated from school and university, entering the labor force, and who is unemployed. People may not be hiring you right now because of situation. The longer you are unemployed at the beginning of your career, the more unemployable you become. And that's especially true for people who drop out of high school with few qualifications and skills. So these longer term scarring elements are the ones we have to keep an eye on. If they become material, then yes, go off, yes, we may end up with stagflation. I, I'm, I'm more confident about deflation side that we may see two and a half to 3% inflation in two to three years than I am on the stag side because I think policy can limit the amount of scarring if we get the proper policy response. Look, I think that when you reduce what we're going through right now, you end up with four major theme. They explain about, call it 80 to 85% of what we're going through. One is exactly what you mentioned, inequality. COVID is proving to be what I call the great unequalizer. It has increased the inequality of income. It has increased the inequality of wealth. And most importantly, it has increased in inequality of opportunity. The second thing we're seeing, not just within countries and around the world, is dispersion. A very big difference in sectors, a very big difference in countries. Um, you know, I used to work at the IMF a long, long time ago. It would have been unthinkable to have a year like 2020, where China may grow by 2 to 3%, and the UK may contract by 11%, Spain by 16%. It would have been unthinkable within the advanced countries to have a 4% contraction in the US and a 16% contraction 
in Spain, but we're having this great dispersion. That's the second theme. The third theme is scarring, the longer term effects. And the fourth theme, which is a result of all that, is what I call the great disconnect. That depending whether you are on Main Street or Wall Street, life is very different. If you're in the financial sector, it's hard to believe that we've gone through a generation defining moment. Um, US indices are at record high, near record highs, depending on which day you talk about. Um, bond prices have been very well behaved. The, the currency markets have been well behaved. Credit spreads, liquidity spreads, any spread you look at is really compressed. And basically, the financial markets tell you there's nothing going on. Everything is fine. Of course, it's a very different issue in the real economy. Europe is back into a double dip recession. The US is slowing really fast. We saw last week's jobless number as yet another indicator. And to reconcile these two things, it's about central bank liquidity. It's about the ample and predictable provision of central bank liquidity. And this is really important to understand that if you're looking around, the Fed is very attractive because the Fed can do things without going to Congress. Not everything, right? But it can do a lot without going to Congress. Um, so the Fed is what people look to as to be not just the first responder, but the constant responder. Now, on the other side, the Fed inherits more and more objectives with the same tools. So what the Fed looks for is to increase its flexibility. So let's talk about what it did in August. In August, it introduced its new medium-term policy framework. And as you pointed out, Zach, the main issue of the medium-term policy framework is more flexibility vis-a-vis -vis the inflation target. That we will no longer aim for a specific inflation target, we will aim for an average inflation target, and we could go well above that number to achieve the average over time. Now, on the surface, that, that looks like great flexibility. If you sort of scratch your head a little bit, so you say, so let me get this right. It, the Fed and of course the ECB on the other side of the Atlantic have not been able to achieve the inflation target. And the answer to that is to raise the inflation target. That doesn't make sense, but it does make sense if you think of them as wanting more flexibility. And that's what they're looking for. As, as they inherit more and more objectives, and now we have four objectives in play. You have to understand. We have the dual mandate, employment and inflation. We have a financial stability objective that's out there. And now, as you pointed out, the Fed has stumbled into an inequality. Let me say, first of all, if you're a low cost producer, if you're Saudi Arabia, if you are Abu Dhabi, um, your outlook is very different than if you're Ecuador um, and you're a high cost producer. If you're a high cost producer, your outlook is pretty scary. It's pretty scary on, on account of three things. One is that demand is being eroded day in and day out by move away from hydrocarbon. And that's gonna continue, that's not gonna stop. Um, if anything, that's gonna build up steam so you have a move away from hydrocarbon and you, you're the high cost producer in that world. That's not great news. Two is that the willingness of a few countries, Saudi, Russia, and UAE in particular, in an OPEC plus context to give up their market share for you is gonna be declining over time. So don't look for others to carry your burden. And then the third element is you are competing with alternative uh, providers of energy. And those pro and alternative providers of energy are gonna be subsidized and you're not gonna be subsidized, right? So I, I do think that if you are a high cost producer, your outlook is pretty grim right now, even when demand comes back. 
Um, if you're a low cost producer, you have time, but that time has to be used to do two things. And you're seeing it happening around the Middle East. One is diversify your wealth. Understand that your wealth that's under the ground can be diversified today to make sure the senior pop, and uh, future populations are as protected as current population have been and past population have been. That's the first thing you do. The second thing you do is, is, is ironically, you are also very well positioned for alternative sources of energy. And you can play it from a position of strength. So, so I do think there's opportunity there, but you have to think very differently from the very strict OPEC mindset, which is we control supply until demand comes back. And this is a repeated game. This is not a repeated game anymore. This is a different game. And there's a lot of tendency now to fade the dollar. Say that this is it, the dollar is, is gonna lose its reserve currency status. Whenever someone tells you that something is gonna go away, the next question, the immediate next question you should ask is what's gonna replace it? Because in a, in a global system, you cannot replace something with nothing. So what, when someone says the dollar is no longer gonna be the global reserve currency, the question is, okay, that's fine, I'll give you that. What's it, what is the global reserve currency if it's not the dollar? And the answer is, well, it can't be the euro because the euro actually is in a worse situation than the dollar is. It can't be the Chinese renminbi because the Chinese renminbi is um, being issued by a country that doesn't have capital account liberalization, that actually doesn't want the currency to be global. It's looking for something else. It can't be the SDR because the SDR, the rate of acceptance of the SDR is quite low. So it has to be the dollar. Right. So, Ibrahim, we're not going to see the dollar give up its reserve currency there, but we are going to see a different global system. And to understand that, let's say you're sitting right now in parts of Asia. You bought into a system where the nucleus of the system is the US. The US is the issuer of the reserve currency. The US has the most liquid global markets. So the US actually, you outsource your savings to the US um, because it, they are the most liquid markets. And in the middle of that, the US acts as the anchor to the system. But when, when you're an anchor, you run an implicit contract with the rest of the world. You provide those services and you get incredible, what they call exuberant privileges from doing so. But in return, you run the system responsibly. And what we've seen in the last 12 years is an erosion in the trust that this system is being run responsibly. First, the global financial crisis originated in the United States. And remember, in this system, crises are supposed to be in the periphery, not in the center. And then second, the US went in 2017 from being the champion of free trade to being the most protectionist advanced economy. So the trust in this system, it gets eroded. So what do you do if you're sitting in Asia? You do what China's doing. You start building pipes, small pipes around the system. And these pipes are pro proliferating. They started by being bilateral payments agreement where two countries settle in their own bilateral currencies and don't go through the dollar. Then it became the, the BRI, which is a regional arrangement that's extended now as far as Italy, just to give you a notion of it. And this initiative, what the One Belt, One Road, the Belt and Road Initiative, comes with a payments element to it. So what we're gonna see is the dollar remain in the reserve currency, but its influence get eroded by all these little pipes that are being built um, in the system. That's, that's what the global system is gonna look like for the next 10 to 15 years.